SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. But right now I'd like to introduce uh, Jack Van Ryan from the mayor of Coaldale. And Jack has been a, an amazing uh, voice for Coaldale for many years. Besides fixing people's electrical problems, he's also uh, been a big supporter of all things that happened in Coaldale over the years. I've been involved a little bit. I used to live in that neighborhood. I had my post office box in, Lep in Coaldale, and uh, Jack has always been involved. Um, and we were very kind, kind to, kind, he very kindly agreed to come to speak about this contentious a topic that he's talking about today. Not everyone want to talk about that. So thanks very much, Jack, and uh, I invite you guys to give Jack a warm welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs, and thank you for having me here today to speak. When Violet uh, reached out to me about speaking at today's meeting, or luncheon, on the subject of politicization of uh, municipal elections regarding amendments coming with uh, Bill 20, I must admit I didn't fully realize the depth and complexity of the topic I was about to dive into. But as somebody deeply interested in politics, and perhaps that's the reason I'm standing here before you today as the Mayor of Coaldale. And for anybody that doesn't know, Coaldale's a vibrant community of 9,500 people just 10 minutes east of Lethbridge. Reflecting on Violet's invitation made me think about the evolving landscape of local leadership and the significant roles that Bills 18 and 20 are playing in shaping the future of Alberta's municipalities. It's a timely and crucial discussion given the profound impact these legislative changes could have on local governance. And I also wanted to uh, acknowledge some other elected officials in the room today. From Coldwell, we have Councillor Bill Chapman, we have Councillor uh, John Middleton Hope, we have Jens Schmidt Rempel, and Councillor Belinda Croson uh, in, in the room as well. So I'm going to be asking for backup from my fellow uh, municipal elected officials. I want to be transparent with all of you. I do not consider myself a subject matter expert on these bills. However, I'm committed to walking through each of them to the best of my ability, highlighting the concerns and implications as we understand them today. Bill 18, the Limiting Municipal Federal Agreements Act, seeks to place restrictions on municipalities entering into agreements with the federal government without provincial approval. These proposed amendments raise significant questions about the autonomy of local governments and the, their ability to respond effectively to the needs of their communities. Meanwhile, Bill 20, the Municipal Affairs Statutes Amendment Act, introduces changes that could further politicize our local elections. This potential shift has sparked substantial debate among municipal leaders and citizens alike, as it threatens to alter the foundational principles of fairness and integrity that our electoral processes are built upon. As we explore these issues, our goal is to illuminate the potential consequences these legislative changes may have on our democratic processes. We must engage in a thoughtful and constructive dialogue to ensure that the integrity of our municipal elections is preserved and that local governance remains transparent, accountable, and representative of communities we serve. 
Thank you for your attention and participation in this important discussion. Together, we can navigate these challenges and work towards solutions that uphold the democratic values to our municipalities. So I'm gonna to touch at a very high level regarding Bill 18, uh, again, limiting municipal federal agreements, an overview of the bill, its intentions, and the potential impacts on the municipal autonomy and operations. It will also explore how that bill could redefine the relationship between municipalities and the federal government and what this means for local governance and decision making. Bill 20, a detailed examination of the amendments proposed to this bill and their significance for municipal administration. I will highlight key changes and discuss how these amendments are designed to improve municipal governance, accountability and service delivery. I will also bring up some examples uh, regarding the town of Coaldale, regarding Bill 18 and 20. Also, we'll touch on governance perspective, a discussion on the broader governance implications of Bills 18 and 20. This will cover the evolving role of local leadership in the Alberta's political landscape and the importance of proactive governance in responding to legislative changes. So regarding Bill 18, I've broken it into four parts. And for each part, I'm going to uh, give some pros and cons to each one of those. So the first one regarding provincial oversight on agreements. So the Bill 18 mandates that any agreement between a municipality and the federal government must first receive approval from the provincial government. This oversight is intended to ensure that all agreements are consistent with the provincial policies and priorities. Some of the pros, uniformity and consistency. By requiring provincial approval, this provision ensures that agreements made by municipalities align with the broader strategic goals and policies of the province. This helps maintain a cohesive approach to governance across Alberta. Another one, strategic coordination. Provincial oversight can facilitate better coordination between different levels of government, potentially leading to more strategic and unified initiatives that benefit the entire province. A couple of the cons against this, reduced autonomy. Municipalities lose the ability to independently negotiate and enter into agreements that directly address their specific needs and priorities. This could hinder local innovation and responsiveness. Also, potential delays. The requirement for provincial approval adds an additional layer of bureaucracy, which could delay implementation of crucial projects and initiatives that municipalities need to address urgently. The next one is around enhanced provincial control. Bill 18 gives a provincial government greater control over municipal agreements with the federal government, ensuring that these agreements are in line with provincial interests and fiscal policies. A couple of the pros, first one, enhance accountability. Provincial oversight can ensure that municipalities are accountable for their agreements, reducing the risk of unchecked or poorly considered arrangements that might not serve the public interest. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit further regarding the Town of Coaldale's policing agreement for the RCMP with the federal government. Another pro, resource allocation. The province can manage and allocate resources more effectively ensuring that funding and support are distributed equitably across municipalities based on strategic priorities. The cons against that one, centralization of power. This increased control concentrates decision-making power at the provincial level, potentially marginalizing local voices and under determining the principle of local self-governance risk of political interference. 
provincial oversight could introduce political considerations into the approval process, leading to a biased or partisan decision-making that may not reflect the best interests of local communities. Financial implications. Bill 18 impacts the financial dynamics between municipalities. The province and the federal government, it aims to ensure that financial agreements are consistent with provincial fiscal policies and constraints. The pros for that, budgetary control, provincial oversight can help ensure that financial agreements are physically, I'm sorry, fiscally responsible and in line with the province's broader budgetary policies, promoting sound financial management. Risk management, by scrutinizing agreements, the province can help mitigate financial risks and prevent municipalities from entering into potentially detrimental financial commitments. The cons, funding limitations. So municipalities may face difficulties in securing federal funding for local projects if provincial approval is delayed or denied, potentially stifling local development and growth. Administrative burden. The additional bureaucratic processes required for provincial approval can increase administrative costs and burden for municipalities, diverting resources away from other essential services. And last, number four, impact on the local federal relations. Bill 18 influences the relationship dynamics between municipalities and the federal government by inserting the provincial government as an intermediately. The pros streamline negotiations with the province acting as a central coordinating body. Negotiations can be more streamlined and efficient, avoiding fragmented and potentially conflicting agreements. Improved policy alignment ensures that local agreements are consistent with both federal and provincial policies, promoting better alignment and co cooperation across all levels of government. And on the con side, strained relationships. The requirements for provincial approval may strain relationships between municipalities and the federal government as municipalities might be seen as less independent and capable of managing their own affairs. And most importantly, loss of local advocacy reduces the ability of municipalities to advocate directly with the federal government for their specific needs and interests, potentially weakening their bargaining position and influence. So in conclusion for Bill 18, introduces significant changes to the dynamics between municipal, provincial, and federal governments. While the intent behind a bill to ensure consistency, accountability, and strategic alignment is commendable, it also raises critical concerns about local autonomy, potential delays, and the risk of political interference. As municipal leaders and stakeholders, it is our responsibility to carefully consider these pros and cons. We must engage in open dialogue to advocate for amendments that protect the integrity and the autonomy of local governance while ensuring that our agreements align with broader provincial and national interests. Bill 18, which deals with limiting, limiting uh, municipal federal agreements, aims to give provincial government oversight over contracts and agreement between municipalities and the federal government. Here are some examples of the types of the contracts and agreements that the province may want to have oversight on, including those affecting post-secondary education and research. First one is infrastructure projects. Federal infrastructure grants agreements where municipalities receive federal funding for infrastructure pro projects like roads, bridges, public transit systems, and water treatment plants. Public transit contracts for developing or expanding public transit systems with federal funding support. 
environmental initiatives such as climate action plans, environmental cleanup, also housing and community development, affordable housing projects, agreements with federal government for funding affordable housing projects or homelessness prevention programs. Community development grants, contracts for revitalizing urban areas, improving community facilities or supporting local economic development. Public safety and emergency services and regarding post-secondary education and research, they will touch on research grants, agreements with federal agencies like the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council or the Social Sciences and Humanitarian Research Council for funding university research projects. Educational infrastructure, contracts for federal funding to support the construction or renovation of university buildings, laboratory and other educational facilities. Collaborative research programs regarding agreements involving federal support for, co uh, for collaborative research initiatives between universities and the federal research institutions. Scholarship and bursary programs, contracts for federal scholarships or bursaries provided to students attending provincial post-secondary institutions. Technology and innovation, Smart city projects, agreements involving federal funding for implementing smart city technologies to improve urban infrastructure and services. Innovation hubs, contracts with federal support to establish or expand innovation hubs and technology incubators within municipalities. And lastly, health and social services, healthcare facilities, Agreements for federal funding to build or upgrade hospitals, clinics, any other health care facilities. Social service programs. Contracts involving federal assistance for local service programs, including mental health initiatives and support for vulnerable populations. These examples illustrate the broad range of agreements and contracts that municipalities might enter into with the federal government which the provincial government seeks to oversee under Bill 18. This oversight aims to ensure that such agreements align with provincial priorities and policies. City of Calgary recently announced that they were asked to provide information on agreements uh, that might have with the federal government in the following areas. Capital funding agreements, building lease agreements, maintenance agreements for federal properties, mutual aid agreements with First Nations, funding agreements for cultural events, community mailbox agreements with Canada Post, and agreements with municipal bodies that hold uh, with the federal government to, defined as any organization that receives 50% or more of its funding through the municipality. So the Alberta Municipalities Association, some of the concerns they have with Bill 18 that they've been quite vocal about are the provincial approval requirements. Again, municipalities, post-secondary institutions and other provincial entities will need to obtain provincial approval to enter into funding agreements with the federal government, which adds an additional bureaucratic layer, layer and could delay funding processes. Potential delays in red tape, impact on federal funding flow, local needs and diversity, missed advocacy opportunities, and conditions on federal funds that include concerns about conditions on federal government might propose to add to existing funds like the Canada Community Building Fund, potentially complicating the funding landscape further. Some of the desired Amendments for Bill 18 by the Alberta Municipalities Association include the development of regulations that will set out criteria and requirements for provincial approvements of agreements, meaning conversations on uh, municipal priorities to ensure that these conversations about the priorities and the impact of provincial oversight on the priorities. Lessons from Quebec's legislation 
looking to avoid pitfalls observed in similar legislation in Quebec that I'll touch on a little bit later, ensuring that essential services are not delayed in excessive red tape. Clear and transparent criteria, respect for local autonomy, and a streamlined process. By addre addressing these key concerns and incorporating the desired amendments, Alberta municipalities aim to ensure Bill 18 facilitates rather than hinders their ability to secure and utilize federal funding efficiently. With Quebec, back in 2001, they passed a bill requiring provincial approval for any municipal agreements with federal government. This legislation aimed to ensure that the provincial government retain control over intergovernmental agreements and maintain unified approach to federal relations. The law emphasized the importance of provincial oversight and municipal dealings with the federal government to protect provincial interests and maintain a coherent policy stance. The key parallels between Quebec's 2001 law and the Alberta Bill 18 include both laws aim to uh, give provincial government control over municipal agreements with the federal government, which I just went through. Unified approach, they seek to maintain coherent and unified provincial policy in dealing with the federal government. And protection of provincial interests, both laws are designed, uh, designed to protect provincial interests that the municipal actions align with provincial priorities and strate uh, strategies. This approach in Quebec has been a place for over two decades, indicating a long-standing provincial interest in managing intergovern intergovernmental relations closely. Alberta's recent legislation appears to be following a similar path, reflecting a broader trend of provincial governments asserting their authority over municipal federal interactions. So in Quebec, some of the problems they had was bureaucrat uh, bureaucratic delays. The requirement for provincial approval introduced significant delays in securing federal funding. This often led to prolonged wait times for municipalities to access essential funds, which in turn delayed the implement and implementation of critical projects and services. Another problem they uh, found was increased administrative burden. Municipalities faced an increased administrative burden due to the need to comply with both federal and provincial approval processes. This duplication of efforts consumed additional time and resources, which could have been better spent on service delivery and project execution. They had problems with lack of clarity and, in approval criteria, erosion of local autonomy, missed opportunities for collaboration, and impact on essential services. Again, delays in increased red tape had a direct impact on the delivery of essential services. Projects related to infrastructure, public health, and community services face setbacks affecting the quality of life for their residents. Some of the lessons learned in Quebec, streamlined approval processes. Alberta municipalities advocate for streamlined approval processes that minimize bureaucratic delays and reduce administrative burdens, ensuring timely access to federal funds. Another one, clear and transparent criteria. Establishing clear, transparent, and consistent criteria for provincial approval is crucial to avoid the confusion and uncertainty experienced in Quebec. Respect for local autonomy. Maintaining a balance between provincial oversight and local autonomy is essential. Municipalities should retain the flexibility to negotiate agreements that best meet their specific needs and priorities. Enhance collaboration. Fostering a collaborative approach between provincial and municipal governments can lead to more effective adv advocacy for improved federal funding and better outcomes for local communities. So by addressing these lessons, Alberta municipalities hope to ensure Bill 18 facilitates effective and timely access to federal funding 
without compromising the delivery of essential services or the autonomy of local governments. In Quebec, the legislation requiring the provincial approval for municipal agreements with the federal government is part of what they refer to as Act M30. This act has been in effect for several decades, specifically since 1970, and it mandates the municipal and school bodies in Quebec obtain prior authorization from the provincial government before entering into any agreements with other governments or agencies. So, with all this being said, for an example, the town of Coaldale, if we were planning a major infrastructure project, such as building a new community indoor pool, the total project cost is estimated to be five million. Coaldale is looking for funding from various sources, including federal and provincial governments. Scenario one, direct funding, Bill 18 applies that Coldell applies for a grant directly from the federal government under a specific infrastructure program that does not involve the provincial government. According to Bill 18, any agreements for this direct funding would require provincial approval. This means Coldell cannot directly accept and use the federal grant without first obtaining permission from the provincial government. Scenario two, federal funding via FCM. So Coldell applies for funding through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which administers federal funds for the municipal projects. Because the funding is administered through FCM and not directly from the federal government to the municipality, Bill 18 does not apply. Coldell can receive and use the grant from FCM without needing provincial approval. Scenario three, Coldell applies for a grant under the federal program where the funds are administered through the provincial government, where the program is co-funded by both federal and provincial governments. In this case, the provincial government is involved either as an administrator or as a co-founder. Bill 18 does not apply. Coldell can proceed with the project using these funds without additional provincial approval related to Bill 18. This differentiation, uh, differentiation applies uh, and helps municipalities understand the pathways available for federal funding in a sp specific scenarios where provincial approval is required under Bill 18. So can I have five minutes for Bill 20? Yeah. I think Bill 20 is more interesting. So, Municipal Affairs uh, Statutes Amendment Act 2024 is a legislative initiative, uh, initiative aimed at updating and refining various statutes related to municipal governance in Alberta. This act addresses a range of issues to improve the efficiency, transparency and accountability of municipal operations to ensure that municipalities can better serve their communities. The key provisions, I'm just gonna skim over them, is enhanced accountability and governance, and that's regarding counselor el uh, eligibility and disqualification, streamlined processes regarding accelerated housing development, also uh, improve public engagement and transparency, and they break all of these down into uh, many different categories. Mm -hmm. And one which I just mentioned is to align uh, candidate eligibility criteria with counselor uh, disqualification criteria. So that is regarding uh, uh, pre-qualification and disqualification. They want to make that so that they align. So when someone is applying to run for council, the way it is now, you can put your name forth and then after you are elected, if anything comes up that could possibly disqualify you, that is discussed at that point. So a good example is if uh, somebody runs for council and they get elected, and then they find out after the fact that they own uh, back residential taxes for three years and they haven't paid, that's uh, grounds for disqualification. So now the provincial government wants to uh, align both of those so that when somebody 
um, wants to put their name forward, they have uh, certain boxes to check off to make sure that nothing comes up that will disqualify them as soon as they are elected. And then I'm just going to skim down to uh, a couple of big ones that our municipal clerk in Coaldale has serious problems with. And those are, uh, the, one of them is referred to as vouching. So in Coaldale, if somebody forgets their ID and they come to vote, and whoever is working the election says, oh, I know, that's Bill Chapman, he lives and at this address, I've known him forever, that's vouching. They're going to discontinue that. The only thing that you'll be able to do now for vouching is to confirm somebody's address. So if Bill picks up his mail at box 712 Coldell at the post office, they can vouch that he lives at this address in Coldell. Another one, uh, which is a big one for uh, the town of Coldell, not only, uh, and not even considering the uh, uh, city of Lethbridge, is regarding the use of electronic uh, tabulators. So with the amendment to the Municipal Government Act will prohibit the use of automated voting equipment in municipal elections. This measure aims to ensure the integrity and security of the voting process by eliminating potential risks associated with electronic voting systems. So that's how we've been doing it in Coldell, that's how Lethbridge does it. And Coldell has a population of 9,500. Back in 2017, when they did the, uh, the counting of the uh, ballots by hand, that took until three o'clock in the morning. City of Lethbridge has over 102,000 people, so you can just imagine how uh, long that is going to take. So that, that is a, a, a big concern for uh, the municipal clerks in our municipalities. And other than that, there's several other ones, but there are, those two are the ones that our municipal clerk wanted me to bring up. So with that being said, I'll um, give it back to Knut. Thank you very much, Jack, for your informative uh, interpretation of the new bills. <coughs> Thank yous go out to Ryan Craddock from Rogers TV, who faithfully come here every week and does a really good job of editing the, um, the talks so they are ready for the YouTube. Today he will not have to uh, insert parts of the PowerPoint presentation because there was none. So <laughs> Speaking like a true politician, you, only politicians can do presentations without PowerPoint, I'm telling you right now. Maybe Dwayne Bratt might, but he's pretty close to a politician himself. I also like to thank uh, Lethbridge Herald. They come faithfully every week and do a little report. And other media often shows up as well. So with that, I open up for question period and uh, please feel free to come up and if you like me to ask a question for you, I can do that if you write it down. State your name, uh, maybe not too long a prelude to your question and, and of course uh, Jack, if a question is inappropriate, Jack doesn't have to answer it. But, yeah, he can pass it down to the Lethbridge uh, councillors. And thank you very much for the Lethbridge councillors and, and Bill Chapman for showing up as well. That's first class. All right. Are you ready, Jack? I am. <coughs> Hi, I have to face this way to ask my question. Yes. Sorry, Henning Mundel is my name. <clears throat> um, I've got a, a sort of a complex uh, question with different components. One is often when uh, something gets legislated, there's something, some trigger. Do you know what the trigger was for Bill 18? Secondly, um, 
adding the bureaucracy, of course, adds cost. So if you have a grant, if you have a cost of five million for your pool, maybe it'll be six million by the time the provincial bureaucracy is added on, so everything gets more expensive. And you mentioned, of course, uh, the delay. And uh, uh, so if you can just try to see how does the provincial government in essence uh, try to establish a de facto additional civil service that all the municipalities come under? Thank you for the question. As far as why Bill 18 uh, is being implemented, I cannot give you an entirely uh, honest answer on that because Obviously, I have nothing to do that with that. I'm um, an elected official that has to deal with it. And basically, in, uh, from my understanding, is that the uh, provincial government w wants more control over what's going on with municipalities and how they receive funds from the federal government and what how they disperse those funds. So th the government wants, provincial government wants to have some oversight on that. One thing that I'll mention um, uh, that I brought up earlier is that where Bill 18 possibly could have helped the town of Colda back in 2016 when we uh, entered into a contract with the federal government for our RCMP policing. So back then, uh, we were uh, what we refer to as a new entrant uh, as per the federal government, which was not the case because we were historically policed by the RCMP. So we even had our administration team go to the uh, museum here in Lethbridge and go through the archives and we found proof which we already knew that we were policed by the RCMP uh, previously. So if you were Policed by the RCMP, you got to go into what's known as a 70-30 split, where the municipality pays 70% and the federal government pays 30%. So that was the agreement that we signed up for. We found out after the fact that the federal government did not have any corresponding evidence that we were policed uh, by the uh, RCMP previous to that. So with that being said, they treated us as a new entrant where we had to pay 100%. And we were the only municipality in all of Canada that had to pay 100% of their policing costs, which for us equated to approximately additional $550,000 a year or more. That was a burden on our taxpayers. So with that being said, we uh, went up to Ottawa, previous uh, mayor went up uh, with our CAO to argue the point. We've uh, sent letters, myself, um, many, many uh, letters. They just disregard them, don't hear anything back. So then we reached out to the provincial government and they went to, uh, went to bat for us uh, right out of the gate. And Minister Ellis, uh, advocated us for uh, on behalf of the town of Coldell, and they didn't get no reply from the federal government as well. So what the provincial government ended up doing for the town of Coldell was to uh, provide us with a grant for $550,000 to make us whole. And that was a huge win for the town of Coldell, and they gave us those funds for 2023 and 2024. And they will look at uh, doing that for us every year until our contract expires with the RCMP in 2020, or I'm sorry, in 2032. So th that's a good example of where Bill 18 would have uh, uh, possibly helped with the provincial government being involved from the onset and helping us negotiate that contract. Something else that uh, that came up that I can explain a little bit too as well is the regarding uh, the housing ac accelerator fund. So Coldell applied for that just like the city of Lethbridge and our staff uh, submitted the uh, paperwork and the scoring criteria for that paperwork we received 100% and when you get 100% marks on application, you think at the end of the day you would get some funds for that. And we never got one cent. 
And the same thing happened with the city of Lethbridge. They didn't get any funds as well. So again, for, for something like that, with the federal government, if we had provincial oversight uh, giving us some help with that, there, that could have been potentially a different outcome. So I'm not sure if I answered your question as far as uh, the extra layer uh, where we're gonna require more staff. Of course, it's gonna take more uh, staff time to go through all this paperwork when it comes to uh, working out the negotiations and the contracts between the provincial and federal government. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Ken Sears. Um, I wanted to talk a bit, ask a question about Bill 20, um, and you didn't touch on it, but my understanding is that it also provides for the creation of local political parties for municipal elections. Now, the question I have with that, can you foresee any problems with that insofar as the traditional model has been the citizens electing an individual citizen on the basis of his or her merits? And putting, a, it would seem to me that putting a program whereby you, that, that citizen is also has to be a member of a political party can mean that someone who's not particularly qualified, but they've managed to get on, on the slate, will get elected, leaving someone who may be far better qualified and a far more to interest in serving the citizens of his community out in the cold. Thank you for that question. And I was going to uh, speak to that, but our moderator was giving me the, the stink eye, so I had to bypass that one. <laughs> I just gotta find where my notes are on that one. While I'm looking at also something that's go, uh, going to be is that the provincial government is going to allow uh, municipalities to create a bylaw that anybody running for uh, election has to have a criminal record check done as well. So regarding the, the political association, I believe, and I can ask for one of my colleagues if they wanna uh, comment on that as well, is that that's going to be earmarked to start with for Edmonton and Calgary, is that correct? So as far as how that's going to affect uh, municipalities the size of Coal Hill and, and other municip municipalities in Southern Alberta, I'm not, uh, uh, up to speed on what that's all going to entail. So I'll open it up if any of my colleagues has any up-to-date information on that. And just while you ask your question, I'm just going to find some information on that because I know I have it. Yep. I'm here. Uh, Terry Shillington. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I want you to hear my question, though. I, <laughs> I, I find myself uh, questioning one of the fundamental assumptions of the legislation, and you're, you appear to support it, that it's a very important to align provincial and municipal policies. Yeah. Now, the provincial government is very ideological and, and a very has a very sharp right-wing stance on a lot of things and often very anti-federal. Um, so I'm, I'm just, uh, but, but many of us live in a culture of diversity and, and we're enriched by that diversity. So there's room for different opinions about health policy or housing and so on. And I just question whether it's really in our best interest to have everything aligned with the provincial uh, policy of the day. Thank you. Uh, just to be clear, like um, I'm not saying I'm in favor or not in favor of Bill 18. All I'm sharing is that with the policing agreement and the um, 
housing uh, description I just went through is that I believe the provincial government could have helped the town of Coaldale uh, with those two uh, opportunities where we wouldn't have found ourselves uh, being the only municipality in Canada having to pay 100% of our policing. As far as the other uh, policies that they are uh, implementing as part of uh, Bill 18, we have to wait to see what the final outcome of that is going to be uh, before we can uh, react appropriately to that. So back to the local uh, political parties. I'll just give you a little bit of background on that one. Uh, the recent amendment to the MGA grants regulation making authority to define and regulate local political parties. This provision aims to standardize the formation, operation, and oversight of local political parties to ensure consistency and fairness in the municipal elections. So the purpose is to establish clear and consistent rules for creating and functioning of local political parties. Regulatory oversight to provide a framework for the regulation and oversight of these local parties, ensuring they operate within defined legal boundaries. The amendment empowers the relevant authorities to create regulations that define these parties, including the registration, funding, and operational requirements. Compliance and enforcement will oversee with these regulations, ensuring that these political parties adhere to established rules. So the pros for doing this establishes clear and standardized guidelines for the formation and operation of local political parties, reducing, reducing and formation of operational local political parties, sorry. Enhanced transparency, mandatory disclosure of financial and operational information that promotes transparency and allows voters to make informed decisions. Improved oversight provides regulatory oversight to ensure that political parties operate within legal and ethical boundaries, preventing mis uh, mis misconduct. Also, level playing field standardizes the rules for all political parties, ensuring a fair and equitable electoral process. And the cons, implementing and enforcing new regulations adds administrative complexity and resources requirements for municipal authorities. Strict regulations and registration requirements may create barriers for new or smaller political parties, limiting political diversity and competition. They also touch on costs, risk of overregulation, and enforcement challenges. So with Bill 18 enabling regulation making authority to define local political parties is a significant step forward towards ensuring a consistent and transparent framework for their operation. While this provision promotes fairness and public trust in the electoral process, it also introduces administration and compliance challenges. By carefully balancing these aspects, mun municipalities can foster a well-regulated and equitable environment for local political parties. So my name is Mark Gettle. I'm just wondering, how much authority does the current... Oh, in front of the mic? Okay, thank you. Uh, how much authority does the current government have, the provincial government have over municipal affairs? I'm thinking of what happened in Chestermere. I don't have all the details, but didn't they go in and dissolve the council or get rid of the mayor, etc.? So what was the situation there and how much authority do they currently have? Do they really need all this new legislation? Thank you. So in Chestermere, the residents requested a uh, municipal inspection and they had sufficient uh, people sign the petition and the municipal government granted a municipal inspection in Chestermere. And the initial conflict, there was ongoing disagreements with the Chestermere City Council, including tensions between council members and their chief administrative officer. There was public 
uh, discontent, growing public dissatisfaction with council operations and decision-making processes. So the municipal government came back uh, with a to-do list as part of the municipal inspection and the CAO and members of council were in disagreement along with the mayor on what the to-do list all entailed. So they refused to do many of the items. So the provincial government kept extending time to them, extending more time and there was no response. So they had to go in and they disqualified I believe three councillors, and uh, including the mayor and the CAO. And they brought in a interim CAO to help get things back on track in Chestermere. So with Bill 18, or in Bill 20, with the um, uh, amendments, they will be given the, the teeth to do that quicker. The MGA already had that part of that in, in the document that allowed the municipal gov government to get involved with that. But because of all the delays uh, with Chestermer, they just wanted to tighten that up so they could do that quicker. Jack, I thought there would have been a big lineup for all your questions here, but it doesn't look like it. You must have done a heck of a job. Uh, presenting your case. Uh, my question relates to uh, uh, existing agreements between towns and anyone with, with federal money coming their way. And I'm also wondering about uh, if you apply for federal money, uh, is there no way that you could let the provincial government know that you're doing that. And if the provincial government says, no, you can't apply for that grant, then you don't apply for it. So it saves you a lot of time and money, and is there any way that that could be implemented, maybe? And one more question, if you can remember all of them here. Uh, what about private citizens applying for federal grants? private corporations applying federal grants. Is the provincial government going to be involved in that as well? Because I, I, as you may know, when we built the potato domes back in the 1978, we did receive a federal grant because they were trying to promote uh, long-term storage for vegetables. Um, would, would that be a problem nowadays, uh, or, or is that outside of your scope of knowledge? Knud, I told you earlier, I just know enough to be dangerous. Okay. So regarding existing contracts, um, there's, uh, they don't come into play. So anything that's ongoing right now, in uh, 2025 when this supposedly uh, becomes uh, law, then any new contracts will have to be um, shared with uh, provincial government for their oversight. As far as individuals, uh, businesses doing uh, federal uh, grants, this Bill 18 is only do, to do with municipalities, not in the private individuals. And if I remember, there was one more question in there. About, uh, well, that would become law that you would have to do that if Bill 18 is enacted. Thank you very much for coming here and speaking to SACPA. And clearly that you had the guts to speak on this topic was very important as we have uh, various members of the Lethbridge Council here to listen to how you have uh, gone through these, these bills, so thank you. Thank you for enlightening all of us. Um, I'm very concerned about what the provincial government wants to do in Bill 18 because it appears to me that the provincial government in power would like to impose their ideology on the municipalities um, and that they're trying to do it both in Bill 18 and Bill 20 
and Bill 18 by um, holding the uh, um, the sword of uh, finances over the heads of municipalities, and in Bill 20 by starting in with um, uh, having parties in Edmonton and Calgary, and then parties in, in uh, that'll be the thin edge of the wedge, and I think that will, they'll want that eventually in all cities. So um, I'm just wondering, you said that this would impact health care and social services if you wanted to put forward a a request for the for the federal government and you wanted to build something in health care and or and or social services um, say you wanted to have a uh, a building or something for um, homeless people or for people who are drug addicted and it went against the uh, the current ideology of the current government are you saying that in in effect um, the powers of the municipalities are swept away by Bill 18. That's a hard question. <clears throat> so as far as um, where you mentioned about any federal grants going to healthcare and the other uh, items that I brought up that you just brought up as well. So with Bill 18, the provincial government wants to have input and oversight on, on those, from my understanding. And then as far as your second part of that question was? Does it take away, essentially takes away the um, governing power of municipalities and just replaces it with provincial ideology? Well, it doesn't take away the power. They're just going to have a, a big brother looking over their shoulder that wants to have uh, input on what the uh, municipalities are doing when it comes to requesting grants from the federal uh, government. So that adds another layer of bureaucracy that we all have to deal with. And that, that falls upon the shoulders of our administration teams because they have all that paperwork that they have to go through over and above what they would normally do if they were just applying on their own. I'd like to know if this scares you. Suppose our provincial government was not the UCP government, but some other government that you that your municipality actually um, was quite frightened of. Does this scare you? It doesn't necessarily scare me. It's it's a it's it's a concern uh, for any municipality when there are, there's added layers of bureaucracy that they have to go to uh, go through. I should say, and, and no matter which uh, government uh, or political parties in in uh, uh, in, in charge, uh, that's something we'll have to deal with when the time comes. Got time for one more? What time is it? One more. One more. Hi, my name is Carol Sakia. I just wanted to clarify the RCMP question. Um, so y your community tried to prove that you had history and you didn't prove it to the satisfaction of the feds. Then the province stepped in, tried to help you prove it too and they didn't like what the province had to say uh, again, I guess. So the province then saved the day by pitching in the money. So I don't have a problem with that. My question is then, so when the province went to help you, they didn't help you. They solved your problem, but they didn't help you. So it doesn't give you, or it doesn't give us, um, there's no proof there that the province in the future when you want to build in your next pool or something, um, would necessarily be able to help you get your pool. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure that you and I agreed that the province, by stepping in and giving you the money, really wasn't solving what they're saying they want to solve with this new bill. Right? Thank you for the question. So back to the RCMP. <laughs> Back in 2016, when we were negotiating the contract, the Conservative government was in power, and the Conservative government was working with uh, the town of Coldell on getting this all uh, 
fixed so that we would be uh, not treated as a new entrant. And then the election came along and then the Liberal government got in power and that's when uh, they closed the door on any uh, discussions, negotiations with the town of Coldell regarding the RCMP uh, policing contract. Regarding the provincial government helping us, they um, went to bat for us with the uh, federal government on trying to get this contract uh, aligned so that it was as per what was negotiated in 2016, but they also encountered the same roadblocks that we as a municipality had as well. And they worked in the background for us as far as what they all tried to do or did do with the federal government on, on our behalf. I, we were not made aware of every item, but uh, in the meantime, the only stopgap measure they could do for us to help us, because that's a significant amount of money for the town of Coldale, is that they granted us that 550000 And moving forward, when we get our policing contract bill every year, we share that with the provincial government, and then they will uh, look at paying us the 30% of whatever that amount is. Thank you very much, Jack, for answering your questions. And we are done now, but do you have a f takeaway question for the crowd here that we can possibly help you along, uh, help municipalities and cities? What should we be doing to help the situation that we were in? Or is there anything we should do in, in your mind? Excellent question, Knut. So anybody that wants to have input on Bills 18 and 20 is that they can talk to their uh, local MLA. They can also talk to their local MP and uh, see what they can do. Uh, Alberta Municipalities Association and same with RMA, the Rural Municipality Association. They have uh, um, lots of information on their websites regarding uh, Bills 18 and 20 and how you can have your input included. So I would suggest that you uh, go to their sites. As far as reaching out to your own uh, uh, municipal leaders, uh, they would have to do the same thing. So if you want to uh, bypass, uh, for, for instance, if somebody wants to give me a letter that I have to submit, you're able to do that yourself by reaching out to AMA or RMA. Well, one, one big uh, shout out for the town of Coldale. On uh, July 3rd, we're having the grand opening of our new multi-use rec center and uh, that's going to be on July 3rd, and that's also the kickoff of the Southern Alberta Summer Games. So I invite everybody to come out for that day. We have um, many events going on starting at 12 o'clock. There's barbecues, uh, music events, everything is free. Come out and check out our new uh, multi-use rec center. Thank you very much. Yeah, be sure to come to Coldale. It's a heck of a nice place to be. Uh, next week, Dwayne Bratt is going to analyze the uh, political landscape of uh, Alberta. So come on out, and it's our ATM following. Thanks very much.